Um, good morning. This talk is basically entitled Bayesian Structural Field Analysis of Large Eddy Turbulent Flow Simulation Using Probabilistic, Probabilistic Graphical Modeling. And it was done in collaboration with my summer intern, Anthony Yao, and my colleague, Dr. Zhang Chang um, of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, I just want to start off with a give like to basically start off with motivation and give a give a preamble as to basically to center your mind as to how, why this work was done. I support basically the military, um, the Air Force, and um, off we're accountable to them. And so any sort of research that we do to them, do for them, we have to basically justify it. And so we can think of a scenario, an applicable scenario in which we talk to a commander like of a of our um, institution. Again, this is not, doesn't happen. Um, this has not indeed happened, just to give you a motto as to um, what's going on. Um, a commander would tell you, if I'm to invest in BBN software like Beige Lab, I want you to demonstrate to me what it can do to me, do for me first. Um, if I'm gonna invest all these thousands of dollars, what can it do for me? And so um, two of the things that I, um, that, um, two of the questions that oftentimes commanders have is, how can this software help me characterize adversarial behavior, which is a state estimation question. And then second for them is this problem of how can it help me decide on what to do based on known goals, which is an optimal learning um, question. So again, trying to formulate the commander's concerns in terms of vocabulary that we all understand. Um, the requests of the a very important request is that it has to be the models have to be easily understandable. The commander does not have time to basically sit there and talk about joint PDFs and, st and basically squint and then not understand what you're saying. Give me a very easy model that I can understand, I can sink my teeth into so that I can basically give you what you need in the long run. Um, Again, easily understandable models and the solution, my personal solution, is to use fluid turbulence as a workhorse to explore a lot of the issues that are concerned concern to them. The idea being that fluid turbulence can be used as a proxy for crowd turbulence or adversarial behaviors. Again, they're not the same, but the tools that you develop for the fluid turbulence analogy could be applicable for the crowd turbulence analogy. Clark crowd turbulence situation, which is what they're actually interested in. If we're looking at um, some adversary on the other side of the world, which we won't mention any names, we want to be able to say, you know, based on their movement, how can we statistically characterize what they're doing and then estimate what they're doing in the future? So this is the outline of what I'm going to cover. Again, it will be basically, it will, it's a really a talk on physics and the application of applied math using Bayesian belief networks to physics. And we first start off with the introduction, which goes over the traditional geointelligence problem. Then we move on to DPF system character, characterization, dynamic particle fields. The dynamic particle field is basically the mathem mathematical representation of the crowd turbulence and the fluid turbulence. We want to go through why this, why do we use, use DPFs for system characterization? Why do we use DPF data for system modeling? And then go over the image particle phenomenology. Then we want to move on to modeling methodology, again, given a global understanding of the processing, processing which is a two-tier processing scheme. Then we want to basically discuss feature extraction and then, of course, move on to hidden Markov modeling. So those are basically are the two um, tiers of this, the modeling methodology. The, f the f more important piece is basically the physical interpretation of the statistics. Basically, when we use these models, in this case, will be hidden Markov models. What do they physically give us to understand the system that we're dealing with? And then end up with basic, then finally end up with the knowledge gradient policy information ranking. So the physical interpretation of the mission matrix is the state estimation part or the system characterization part. And then the knowledge gradient policy, which is very different, it's a different approach than what I think many of you are used to, that I used in a lot of my work. Um, that's basically the optimal learning part of, the, um, of our research and then give some final conclusions. Um, so the introduction, military geo, geo intelligence, electro optical remote sensing platforms are often tasked with monitoring complex 
human, including human systems, change over time. Basically, the military has systems, satellites, ground obser observatory, um, towers, radar, situated all over the world, and they're basically grabbing information all the time. Um, the Navy is using this data for mine detection. The Air Force is using this data for adversarial motion, on, um, characterization, and home security. Um, Homeland Security is using it for crowd turbulence assessment. The idea being that if you go to Washington, D.C., they want to make sure that you get out of there alive. That if you go to see the monument, you don't get your head blown off just because you want to see um, us, um, some of the, um, the pinnacles of our um, society, of our culture. Um, traditionally, linear optimal Bayesian estimates have been used as state estimators to address this, these sorts of problems. However, real world systems are highly nonlinear and probabilistic so that the traditional approaches don't always apply. Um, knowledge of the, of the dynamical system model just does not exist, very much like what Steve was talking about yesterday. We just don't have models. Um, State estimation, if you, want to, if you want to predict what the adversary is going to do, if you want to predict the future, we have to basically learn or do model learning or system characterization first before we can even predict anything. And we choose to do that using dynamic particle fields obtained from large eddy simulations. I have colleagues who are basically numerical modelers in um, the fluid dynamics, fluid dynamical community. They were gracious enough to lend me data. And I found that the data is actually very useful for exploring a lot of these issues that are of interest to the military. Um, in particular, um, what we want to do with this dynamical particle field data or LES data is basically optimal temporal Bayesian system characterization. The idea being that we want to, as the system evolves in time, how can we characterize it robustly so that we can make predictions in the future? And again, that will be, more, be made more clear as we go on and talk. Um, once we have these parameterized system models, we can basically do the state assessment or state e estimation. Um, why do we use DPF data for DPF data for system modeling? Well. Turbulent particle fields have a strong similitude to marine and human many body systems of interest. Basically, these particles are moving around in a domain. And from the perspective of a satellite that's many kilometers up in the air, a lot of times adversaries simply look like ants. They move, they coagulate, they disperse, very much like particles in, in a, um, a numerical simulation. The DPF data, DPF, um, data emanates from the DPF equations. We know the equations, so we basically know what's going on. That's important. The that we have both the driving force and we have the imagery motion. That's important because a lot of times when you go to the open source literature, you have one piece of data observations, but you have no driving force information at all. So you don't know what caused anything. With at least with the, it's true. Fluid turbulence is not crowd turbulence, but at least with the fluid turbulence, you have both and you know what the equations are. Um, the DPF data is also noiseless and seemingly random and allows for pure algorithmic explore, explore, exploration. We want to focus on the tools that can allow us to make sense out of particles moving around. It's noiseless and it's seemingly random. And because it's noiseless, we won't have to worry about issues associated with the data. We can focus purely on the algorithm de development, which is what the commander really wants at this stage. DPF system characterization, um, basically image particle dynamic um, phenomenology. Um, the dynamic particles are basically point traces repre which represent different phenomena, which is basically people or objects. Just basically taking dirt thrown in a domain in the fluid and it's just moving around, very much like um, this cup. Um, if you can imagine if, there was, if it was square and you put dirt in it, the particles are just moving around, being pushed by basically the ambient fluid. Um, what um, Stefan was talking about, the worms, um, are basically what happens at the micro scale. Those are the, the eddies which are responsible for moving the particles, the vortices, so to speak, that basically are the driving force behind what you observe as the particles move around in the domain. Again, the modeling point, though seemingly random, though seemingly we joggle it around, though seemingly random, the point that 
that's actually structured in the domain, just that it's not really available to our eyes. The particle patterns emerge as particles come together and then disperse and come together and then disperse, very much like how people do. When we look at basically adversaries from the satellite position, we see that basically they come together, they disperse, they come together and disperse, just like particles in a turbulent domain. Again, that's one of the reasons why we feel that the tools may be applicable. Again, DPF dynamics mimics how chaotic state of geointelligence processes with an organized, pat, organized or pattern-like quality. Um, again, the organized pattern will maybe allow us to basically get in, get, be able to obtain, it may be able to lend us insight into adversarial tool behavior. Again, trying to make or push this analogy for the purpose of tool development. Again, turbulence is not, fluid turbulence is not crowd turbulence, but the tools may be very um, applicable to both regime, regimes. Um, easy two-tier processing. I'm not going to go into all the details. Um, the objective of the DPF data system model is to employ machine learning algorithms to create a probabilistic graphical model. Again, this is our domain. We have this fluid with basically dirt particles in it, and we just basically exert a pressure gradient in one direction. You, I mean, and it's, basically stays constant in this direction. So we just basically watch how this flow evolves. So we just share it in this direction and this basically asks a question, what do we see? Again, the domain is basically, the first step is to cut it in half. Basically, just horizontally in half, the bottom layer into a bottom layer and a top layer. The bottom layer basically is what we will associate with the vorticity, which is the state. The top layer is what we can see from above with a satellite. Those are the observations. So again, from our state estimation um, theory that we know we have states, we have observations. Um, those two can actually be brought together later on with a hidden Markov model. Again, um, bottom layer is causal, causal states. This is basically where a lot of the dynamics is happening, and basically the fluid responds and we observe it from the top, so observations. The second part of the processing is the hidden mark of Bayesian model parameter learning. Again, um, we're taking, we distill all the information from the top into one value, all the information from the bottom into one value, and we do that for many, many realizations. Let's say n realizations. Single value for the top, single value for the bottom. Um, state, observation, state, observation, state, observation. We're playing cards with the fluid. State, observation, state, observation. After a while, using instant counting, we can basically estimate two quantities, A and B. A is basically the transition probability for the states, and B is basically the emission probability. Again, those are the two aspects of the hidden Markov model. Basically it's saying that if I keep watching the system, basically state, state and observation over a long enough time, then I could be able to tell you statistically in the mean what the transition probabilities are associated with it moving in time. And also for each state, what observations were you, are you most likely gonna see? Um, the, parameter, the parameterized HMM, again, allows us for system characterization later on, which we will not do system characterization, but that's the purpose of it. Again, the assumptions of the hidden Markov model are actually very interesting. Two assumptions. The state is one assumption is that as you move from state to state, if you're in one state, state N, the previous state, what what you are at this point in time is only dependent on what you were basically the state before. So what does that mean? Um, what you are today is only dependent on what you were yesterday. It's not dependent on what you were two days ago. It's not to say the past doesn't matter, but everything that encompasses you can be taken from what, for what, from what happened yesterday. Independence simply means that the observations for each of the um, states don't have, don't have anything to do with, another, do with one another. So Markovian aspect for the state, independence for the observations. 
Um, again, the global methodology is basically um, actually very simple. Again, we're gonna just go through it very quickly. Um, we decompose, again, our domain into basically surface values, observations, um, bottom values, or states. We do that for many, many variables. In fact, what happens is that we end up with seven observations in the top, two observations in the two states in the bottom. So two subsurface values, seven surface values. So basically two causes or states, seven observations. So those are the seven surface features or effects and the two surf subsurface features or causes. Causes are vorticity and stress. Crowds feel have vorticity and stress. You pop a gun, everybody's gonna run through those doors. That's a stress. How you react, how the particles move, those are the features. That means as, appl as applied to a crowd turbulent situation, for instance, as the people go through the door, there'll be movement laterally. Again, there'll be a cross flow scale, so to speak. Again, a feature. So causes, impulses, stresses, effects or observations such as how basically you react. And it's basically what our subsurface and surface feature time series looks like. Again, we're dealing with that issue of data paucity that Steve talked about. I have 41 measurements, that's all I have. There's, not, there's nowhere around it. Um, our planes, you know, oftentimes military planes fly into areas that they're probably not supposed to be in. They take up, they take images, 41 snap, 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 and then they're out of there. That's all that you have. You cannot get any more information than that. But you have to make some sort of assessment of what's going on. So data paucity is a basically endemic to basically geointelligence. This is all that you have. Basically, the question is make sense of it. Again, the top time series are vorticity and stress. The causes, the bottom part is basically the effects, those seven effects that we spoke of that I talked about. Again, seven, seven surface features or effects, two subsurface features or causes. We don't need all of them. Let's reduce them. What do we do? We use EOF analysis. Out of the seven, out of the nine possible candidates that we can use for modeling, how we need to basically squeeze it down. We found that vorticity and all these other variables, um, four variables, are the best candidates using the EOF analysis. Um, those are the ones that have the highest power variance, and that's what those arrows mean. The vorticity and three effects, um, RMS, PCA, base velocity, and other things. Again, what they are, not very important. The idea being that you could go from nine to four features. Um, again, we after we do that part, the ceiling or reducing the dimension of our problem from nine to four, we just basically do, we're able to use those four features in, in HMM parameter estimation to estimate the transition and emission matrices. So basically, we have the data, let's throw it into the machine, the HMM machine, see what we get. Um, and some of the results are actually very interesting. I'm just gonna show you two emission matrices which are very interesting. This is basically the relationship between subsurface vorticity and um, velo surface cross flow velocity. So the vorticity that's like this, if the flow is in this direction, the vorticity that, that's like this, that's basically the subsurface state. The cross flow velocity V that's basically the surface feature. The way that I explain it to, to the commander that basically the vorticity and the armaments velocities are dynamic cousins. He doesn't understand fluid dynamics. He doesn't care about fluid dynamics. What he cares is about understanding the, the logic about what I'm doing. So I explain, him, explain, that, I explain to him that angular momentum, the ability for flow to go this way, is related not directly, indir indirectly to basically surface velocity. They're cousins, they're related dynamically. Again, and these are just simply the numbers. You can note, you'll note that for each row, the probability is basically sum to one. So for each vorticity level, 
this probabilities for velocity for velocity RMS velocity sum to one, and I'll go through some of the interesting aspects of this um, of this of these results. What's the relationship between vorticity and RMS velocity is actually very interesting and complex, and it's very interesting that even with forty one data points. Bayesian belief networks, which the HMM is a crude version of, it can tease, tease out very interesting physics that um, is well known in the modeling community, but it has never been used in a system modeling um, situation. Um, it's a very complex emission matrix due to the nonlinear relationship between the vorticity and the RMS surface velocity. At low surface velocities, at low vorticity levels, there's a low RMS velocity, V velocity, 0.6, 60%, but there's also a high RMS V velocity, which is 40%. Now, you would think that if the vorticity, again, our flow is going, if the mean flows in this direction, the vorticity, there's a vorticity component in this direction, you would think that if the vorticity is low like this, that the surface velocity should be low also. It's not. That's what's really interesting. And the reason is actually quite interesting. Low vorticity, which is the cause, again, this is causing the surface flow that we see at the top. The low vorticity basically causes a low stress. Low stress basically gives rise to, rise to low sediment injection into the water column. What that means is that there's sediment in this flow. Um, as the eddy, as the vorticity churn or moves in this direction, it's bringing particles to the surface, but it's bringing a very low amount, not a very high amount, because the vorticity is low, the stress is low. The feel adjusts to the sediment, basically the sediment modulation. There's not a lot of sediment being brought to the surface, so in actuality, the turbulent fluctuations increase. They don't decrease. So low vorticity levels you would think will be associated with low velocity, but they're not. They're associated with high because you don't, you're not bringing enough particles to the, top, to the surface to damp the fluctuations. So basically, the, um, the flow can basically ramp up and get a lot of um, turbulent fluctuations at the very, very small scale. So that was something that was very interesting. Um, at medium vorticity levels, strong percentage at medium and high RMSV velocities, not too exciting there. At high, at high vorticity levels, this is really interesting. Strong percentage at medium and low RMSV velocities. Again, you would think that if the vorticity was going very, very, very strongly, you would think that basically the surface velocity would be very, very strong also. It's not. It actually, What's happening, the vorticity is bringing particles to the surface, it's killing the turbines. It's like basically tur turning the surface, fl surface layer into syrup. You're going from water to syrup. The turbulent eddies damp, the RMS velocities just drop. It's basically oftentimes, this flow is very curious. As there's a, basically it's like a person who's like, um, as my colleague liked to um, use the analogy, he's like overeating. The turbulent flow can only eat so many particles. After so many particles, it just vomits it out. And so you can basically, if you vomit it out, you can eat more. So the turbulent monster is basically eating particles, vomiting it out, eating particles, vomiting it out. And the Bayesian Belief Network can capture that process. Again, um, another emission matrix um, I want to show you is basically the relationship between vorticity, again, this cause at the bottom and basically a surface feature the effect at the top this time is concentration concentration here is very interesting because they're not they're more like distant kinematic cousins they're not dynamic cousins vorticity and velocity are related basically dynamically they're basically components of the navier stokes equations they're force based force variables but the relationship between vorticity and spatial scales, um, concentration spatial scales are not very, it's a very kinematic um, situation. It's like basically if a person coughed, the spray of his cough would just float around in the room. There's no kinematic, 
There's no dynamic, real relationship between it. The eddies move it, and they just basically move around um, in the basically the sea of, of sea of fluid. So it's a kinematic situation more than a dynamic one. One, one. We expect a strict inverse proportionality, but we will find that it's again not really true completely. Um, low vorticity levels basically beget. Small, small and large sediment spatial scales, 50%, 40%. We ask the question, why? Low vorticity, low shear, allows for large sediment amalgamation and small scale residuals. So what's happening is that when you have a low amount of vorticity, you have these sediment particles which basically amalgamate in the fluid and the vorticity level is so low that they cannot be shredded apart. So they just basically stick together through the electromotive force particles at that scale have. Um, so that's why basically we have a very, very large amount, relatively large amount of, of um, particles at the large scale. Um, very little at the medium scale and also small scale is actually very significant pretty significant. What that is just basically the residual particles just basically dance around in the fluid. Basically like if everybody's coughed, um, there'll always be these micro particles, spray bubbles basically floating around in a room. No matter what you do, they're just sitting in the background. Um, at medium vorticity levels, we have small, medium, and large spatial scale support. And again, they're all about 30%. At this scale, what's happening, the stress is shredding everything apart, and they're basically, everything is almost like even keel. Small sediment scales, low, low small sediment spatial scales, medium, and then high. Um, again, it's a breakdown of all scales in the fluid. High vorticity level is very interesting. 71% at the medium spatial scales, zero at the large spatial scales. Low vort the high vorticity is just shredding apart all the particles that's in the fluid. So again, high shear, high vorticity destroys large spatial scales. So the takeaway, low, vort low vorticity, small and large spatial scales, high vorticity, medium and small spatial scales. Again, weak enough to support large spatial scales and in some instances, instances strong enough to destroy large spatial scales when it's very, very high. So vorticity can shred, um, when it's high, it can allow for particles to amalgamate when it's low. And again, this is important because it's applicable to geo-intelligent system, systems describing adversarial behavior. Again, crowds exhibit stresses and effects. Um, crowds basically coagulate. You can see it at the bus stop when we, when we, um, we, when we met um, for um, getting on the bus that we crowds, one particle that's a person that's standing in front of a bus basically learns from everybody else that's at their bus and they'll tend to do the same thing. They tend to coagulate and they'll tend to basically move into groups. They'll figure, well, he's going to, he doesn't know this person now. He's going, it looks like he's going to the Beijing Lab conference. Um, that looks at the right place. I'm going to follow suit and do the same thing. Um, people coagulate, you know, they, it happens all the time, but they also disperse. Gunfire again will cause people to say, oh man, something's going on. Everybody basically moves out of the, out of the area. Again, human systems feel stress and cause and coagulating, disperse in complex ways. So that's the system characterization um, part of the, this research. Something that you probably are not used to seeing, but I'm probably you've seen it in some form or another in your, in your work is something called optimal learning. And what's interesting about this is that Bayesian BBNs, Bayesian belief networks, they're really, we usually use them as state estimators. We can use them as optimization tools, but usually they're state estimates through the joint PDF. But what optimal, optimal learning is doing, it's saying, it's asking, it's not a question of what, State estimates are questions of what? I want to know what something is giving something else. It's a, it, that's that we're used to. But with optimal learning, what the situation is, is that we know the what, we know what we want, we know the goal state. The question is, how do we get to that goal state in a, in a rational manner? Now, I know that there's tools in Beijing um, Lab to do that, but 
the approach is a little bit different because it's using a policy um, that is um, probably not something that we're used to. So consider, the, again, the nine measurement problem, nine measurement array, seven surface variables, two, two subsurface variables. Again, those two um, vorticity and stress and all the other seven variables at the surface. And leadership asks me, projects, leadership knows what they want. They project basically a future value for the nine variable state. Leadership has limited resources. I can't sample everything. You know, we have limited, we have limited, limited, limited boots on the ground. I need to know where I should focus my resources on. This is not a game, this is life and death. So you know, let's really think about this in a very rational way. I want the ra a rational way to basically look at this problem. So what order should the variables be sampled over time to reach the projected goal state? So the question is how to collect information efficiently. And this, that's the knowledge gradient processing or optimal learning. Sometimes you'll see this reinforcement learning. Um, we're estimating the path towards the mean goal state as star. We assume a prior mean vector theta naught and, and a, a covariance. And then basically we do this march over iterations of time. Um, basically over N, where SN is changing constantly. So we learn our approach, our goal state, by sampling that data mean turbulent feature um, vector. Those are the information sources. And then we choose one variable every time we sample. So every time, every N, we're choosing one of those nine variables to move us into the next state. But the way that we choose it is to basically the, um, the devil's in the details. The, the way that we choose is basically the knowledge gradient policy. It's not an arbitrary choice. Um, the knowledge gradient is the amount by which the state improves its, if feature X prime from M equals nine is selected. The marginal value of measurement in terms of information value is gained. Again, we're measuring or trying to understand the value of a piece of information. So the optimal decision or choice is a choice that causes the largest change in a utility function. The utility function is meant to maximize reward or basically minimize opportunity cost. Updated Bayesian state produces an optimal state path through time. What this is basically analogous to, Richard Feynman, the great part on quantum physicist, um, set, um, made this curious idea that electrons, electrons at one position needs to move to another. And so you had this curious idea that in fact, the electron moves along all paths, but in the mean, there will be one optimal path that it takes. It's a similar idea, it's not the same, but it's a similar of way of thinking. This, this idea that you can basically tease out of a system what is optimal or rational based on some sort of principle or policy. Again, um, the, op the Nas gradient policy is very um, similar to the method of steep de steepest descent, um, which I show the equation in which um, the state is updated every time we make a measurement. And these are just, I want to show two simulations that we did with the basically the nine variable um, array that we had. Um, we start off in blue, basically, in red, you see the truth. That's basically what we are trying to obtain. What we start out with, start out with is the prior. That's shown with the basically the black bar, black horizontal bar at the level of five. After we put that information to the Nas gradient policy um, machine and it grinds T1, T2, T3, T4. At T equals 21, we see that our estimate in red, it's similar to basically the truth. At the final estimate, we see we have basically our convergence. What's interesting is that T equals 21, the estimate is less accurate that, than at T equals 41. Actually, that makes plenty of sense because we need time for that KGB, KGP algorithm to converge. What's very interesting is that not that specific variables over the iteration scheme converge. Three, five, and nine converge first. Don't worry about what they are. I'm just trying to illustrate the principle. The idea is that if you have a nine variable array and you want to approach a goal from a prior, 
some value, some variables matter more than others. They're not all equal. And so basically, um, the graph suggests that some variables may be more significant in reaching the Bayesian goal state than others. Again, this is for the prior, um, prior equals five case. For the prior equals 10 case, um, we have the same idea. We, put, we have the prior at 10. We're trying to basically approach what's in red. We see that both, that, that basically there is no convert, real good convergence at t equals 21. At the final estimate, again, we have some convergence at 8, 9, and I believe that's 4. Um, so overall, less accurate than in the um, prior equals 5 case. That makes sense because what you believe influences what you basically will get in basically the future. If you believe, if what you believe about the truth is off, how you march to it will be affected. That's what you see here. The prior equals five case and the prior equals 10 case, that's to be expected that they're different because you assumed different things. Um, lack of overall variable convergence suggests that the prior equals 10 case is too high and more convergence time is, is needed. Um, the vorticity, of course, is estimated very well in a pro, um, very well compared to the prior equals five case because vorticity is very high now, um, and so that the prior at ten is closer to that value, so it estimates pretty well better than the previous prior, prior equals five case. Um, in this situation, a different set of variables that are, are seem to be important five, eight, and nine. Um, with respect to the convergence. And again, that makes sense. What your prior is will influence what variables are going to be important in the mean. Um, the overall KGP conclusions, the goal state convergence time varies depending on covariance or the, basically the variable correlation and basically the prize assumed, just like you see in any BBN um, scenario. Um, no matter if it's Bayesian belief networks, which what many of you are using, or HMNs. What we believe affects how we obtain our goals. So in conclusion, the Bayesian algorithms applied to DPF data can be used to rationally un understand simulated turbulent shear flow structure. The HMN models capture the dynamic and sediment-induced nonlinear flow dampling in a sparsely sampled fluid, fluid, flow, fluid flow. What that's saying is that with all the work that you do in modeling something as simple as this, um, in the mean with only 41 samples, the BBM basically can, or the hidden, hidden Markov model, which is the cousin of, the, of a classical BBM, can capture the same physics. Um, in this case, the nonlinear flow damping. Um, KGB, the KGP algorithm provides a rational and resource-saving guidance as to how to attain a goal state based on Bayesian learning powered by information source covariance. Um, just like your B BBNs are powered basically by the conditional probabilities tables, um, mine is basically powered by the same thing, um, just basically covariance. Again, I wanted to stress it's not just data interpolation. I had an argument with my colleague. Um, with this situation, we're actually in a crude way injecting a sort of mind into the problem um, so that we can basically um, obtain a goal state. We're being guided by a principle, which is kind of like a mind, like finding oftentimes story of the universe is having like a consciousness. It doesn't have one, but he kind of sometimes thought about it that way. And same thing holds here. Um, policies, functional policies can act as a crude form of mind. And we develop algorithms possibly to applicable, that are possibly applicable to crowd turbulence. Of course, fluid turbulence, not crowd turbulence, but the tools may be actually applicable. Um, and presently we're seeking ways to utilize BBN software like Bayesian Lab to automate and ease calculations. So, we achieve basically a mathematical model. I think that the commander is happy with. Now we're at a point that we can probably try to actually utilize some of the software to make it more automated and to make it easier for basically analysts who are working at the lower part of the totem pole to do their job more effectively. Um, that's it. If there's any questions, I'll take them. Thank you for listening.
All right. Thank you, Nick. Yep. Uh, this is what I'm talking about. Yesterday, when I mentioned cross-disciplinary, cross-functional, I mean, I think you very well represent that just making that transition, fluid dynamics, crowd dynamics. I think that's, yeah, that's where I'm getting ideas from. And I hope you, you all feel the same way, that uh, that's the purpose of this event, of this conference, that we really engage with other fields. And I, I think this was a great example to make that connection. So any questions? Young? It's really interesting. Uh, hey, Nick, I have yep. a question on the, I mean, this is a nice presentation. If you figure out how to do in BB, uh, we would like to learn from you how to do that. OK, uh, sounds good. Yeah, so the idea, your top level idea is the fluid dynamics with particle inside it is like a human movement. Correct. If you can reproduce this, hopefully you can also reproduce the Developing set, set up the image, right? Correct. The idea is to basically develop tools for the fluid turbulence and that may be applicable for crowd turbulence situations, yes. Okay, there, there are a lot of techni uh, technical details I, I can probably learn from you later. But one specific question on this is the utility function you mentioned, right? That's yep. like a reward function. How yep. do you come up with that function? It's something that's actually used a lot in business. Um, it's the KGP is an algorithm that is actually more useful in your situation when you have a lot of variables, like almost like thousands. So what it happens is that it tries, in a nutshell, it tries to minimize opportunity cost. I want to select each time I'm marching time. I want to select basically a quantity that has that is going to contribute to a change in variance, but also one that it doesn't cause me to miss out on anything. So that the next best solution is not that different than what you chose. It's a very, I'll discuss it with you after, but um, that's basically what it's doing. The reward function is trying to optimize choosing the best or the, the variable that changes the variance to, uh, to a large extent, but one that also doesn't cause it to miss out on anything. So. The way to think about it, if you have a curve, a sinusoid, if you want to approximate, that's the state, if you want to approximate that sinusoid, you're not going to sample here and then here and then here and then here. You're going to sample here and then here and then here and then here because you want to capture the overall state. You're not going to just sample one part of the sinusoid. You're trying to sample the whole thing. So you basically spread out your measurements. That's what it means by change. It looks for the basically, it tries to find the measurements that give the greatest change. If I want to figure out what you're going to do today, I'm not going to look at what you just do Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. I'm going to look at what you do Monday in June, um, Tuesday in March, Friday in um, November. It's going to, I'm going to spread them out. That changes what fuels basically the measurement process in a nutshell. Thank you, Scott. It's really a great presentation. Uh, one important question which I want to ask, that uh, normally the Bayesian uh, application uh, is uh, in the domain of uh, non-parametric modeling. While you are, uh, uh, you are model, uh, as you discussed, that you are using uh, nearest stroke equations and you are model uh, fluid dynamics, which is a sort of a parametric uh, case. Yeah. So uh, uh, do, how can you uh, bridge these two things? Because one tool is uh, spatially designed for non-parametric applications and you apply on parametric side. Correct. What I'm doing, I'm taking the, 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 the scientific question that's actually being addressed is that if I know the truth, from the Navier-Stokes equations, which we do know the flow has memory. We know that it basically is nonlinear. If I use this crude ver this crude model, which as you said, non-parametric, can I apply it to this to these to the results of the of these uh, model equations that basically finding some way um, results that I know it's act that I know is actually applicable to the domain. So I'm using a dumbed-down version 
of the of a statistical model to see if I can reproduce characteristics which I know are in the equations. That's you're right. I, there is a schism, but the idea is being even if there's a schism, can I use this crude model to at least mimic what's going on and actually give explanations that are in some way that in some way makes sense. Thank you. Oh. This is excellent work, sir. I just, uh, this has to do with the uh, rid of the crowd turbulence aspect. Right. Um, it, it's got me thinking about the change detections, cyber defense, uh, some of those challenges of, of having a knowledgeable ad adversary. Yep. So how do you treat, in that, in that bullet right there, how do you treat the fact that you may have some smart particles? Um, Actually, that's actually the next step. I'm, I'm actually, I sent an email out this week where I want to actually work with folks um, at the University of Delaware and at um, the Naval Research Lab where I'm trying to mimic smartness in the fluid by introducing artifacts in the flow, in the boundary conditions that perturb the flow from its natural state. Again, seeing, that, like for instance, um, there, there. Um, I, one of the things I would like to do is basically um, have a flow domain where I'm injecting vorticity at specific points in the domain. Again, it's smartly doing it. It's doing it in. A, it's not in a random way. It's doing it in specific um, parts of the flow, and then trying to see if I come if I can come up with a modeling modeling scheme to account for what's going on. So basically trying to, again, use the fluid and mimic basically consciousness, so to speak, in the fluid, putting in funky boundary conditions which aren't really real, but the flow will evolve and respond and then develop tools to deal with that response and say, okay, it worked here. Let's see if it can work for the crowd turbulence situation also. Thank you.